Good evening, and welcome to our MicroPulse webinar. This evening's topic is tissue sparing MicroPulse therapy and medium laser applications for macular disorders. My name is Tim Buckley, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Iridex. I'll be your moderator this evening. And before we get going, I'd like to give you just a quick overview. In tonight's webinar, we will review anti-VEGF non-responders, subclinical diabetic macular edema cases, and we're going to be sharing users' treatment pearls of this repeatable tissue sparing therapy. You as the audience may submit a question to our panel at any time. So simply open the chat feature and send your question. So there will be a button uh, right below, uh, right in the middle of your screen. Your identity will be considered private, so when these questions come in, only the host, myself, will see these questions. Our live panel will field those at the conclusion of their presentations. So to get going, I have the privilege of introducing our first speaker this evening, Dr. Sam Mansour. He is a clinical professor of ophthalmology at the George Washington University. He is board certified in ophthalmology from the American Board of Ophthalmology and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and the American College of Surgeons. So Dr. Mansour is our first commercial user of Micropulse laser therapy with our yellow laser, the IQ-577. Following him, our second speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Luttrell. So he practices vitreoretinal surgery in Ventura, California. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Ophthalmology and a member of the American Society of Retina Specialists. Dr. Luttrell was the first commercial user of Micropulse with our infrared system. So with that, I'll let Dr. Mansour take it away. Hi, and uh, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, integration of Micropulse laser therapy in the management of my diabetic uh, macular edema patients. Um, before we uh, discuss the clinical cases, I want to first explain what exactly is micropulse. Uh, if we take a continuous wave laser beam and chop it into a series of repetitive microsecond pulses, that is basically what micropulse uh, does. This allows the tissue uh, being treated to cool between the pulses and therefore reduce the thermal buildup to below photocoagulative uh, levels. What this results in is a greater confinement of the phototherapeutic or phototermal effect and allows uh, better outcomes without any collateral damage to the adjacent tissues. If you look at the uh, illustration on the right, uh, here is a uh, schematic of what the actual micropulse laser beam looks like in profile. You have a series of on and a series of off periods. In this example, at 10% duty cycle, the laser beam is actually on for only 10% of the pulse duration. It is off for nine-tenths of that time. It, that's in contrast with the illustration to the left, which shows a continuous wave laser, uh, which is clearly on uh, for that entire 200 uh, uh, millisecond duration. One thing we want to uh, clear right from the start is a continuous wave, whether it's subthreshold or pattern or scanning, is not micropulse. Uh, to give you a good illustration, uh, this was recently published uh, this year uh, by Inagaki uh, and his co-authors. You look at the scan on the left, that is a continuous wave subthreshold uh, scanning pattern laser. And what you see is the effect it has on the RPE cells. Uh, there you see at the arrow points is fluid-like spikes that are adjacent to these ruptured RPE cells. By contrast, the scan on the right shows a patient who's been treated with a, a micropulse or MPLT where you see no evidence of any uh, RPE damage. Uh, the schematic on the uh, left in this slide shows what the actual tissue pattern is like with the delivery of a continuous wave, whether it is through the DRS or ETDRS or the modified ETDRS, you have a central core of basically photocoagulative or areas of cell destruction, and then you have a halo of indirectly treated tissues which uh, results in an upregulation of beneficial factors like PEDF and TSP1 as was uh, has been published in years the past. Now, by contrast, if you look at the schema on the right, this is the laser profile or tissue treatment profile of an MPLT. 
And what you have is the entire area that is treated with the laser does, is non-lethal and does not reach photocoagulative damage. And therefore, all those tissues, all those RPE cells, uh, will be recruited in the upregulation of these other factors that we mentioned. Another interesting thing with MPLT that was uh, discovered early on, thanks to Vajosevich, uh, which was published in Retina in 2010, was that if you compare subthreshold modified ETDRS protocol treatments compared to MPLT, there's actually an increase in retinal sensitivity with MPLT treatment while there is a decrease in retinal sensitivity, even with these uh, very mild, uh, previously thought of as mild treatment patterns with continuous wave. Not only is, uh, is this uh, retinal sensitivity manifested on microperimetry, but we also know from uh, a study that Levinsky uh, and the co-authors have published last year in IOVS that there is not only a significant reduction in the central mean thickness as established on o OCT between micropulse versus modified ETDRS, but as well there's an improvement in the visual acuity parameters Now, if you compare anti-VEGF monotherapy versus MPLT, we see that it comes out again ahead, uh, whether it is uh, uh, the Restore, Resolve, or READ2 studies, that both the mean CMT change as well as the improvement in visual acuity as established by the best corrected visual acuity and the ETDRS chart and the number of uh, lines gained um, it is significantly better than the uh, monotherapy. And in addition, if you look at the bottom of the yellow highlighted cell, the number of interventions per year is significantly less in comparison with any of these other uh, treatment modalities. Now, I'd like to uh, share a, a three-case uh, series, uh, my experience with MPLT. The first case involves a type 2 diabetic uh, who has diabetic macular edema and had received approximately four intravitreal Avastin injections a month apart. Here in the upper scan, you see the results uh, after the, about 30 days after the fourth and last Avastin injection. The vision is 20, 40, 20 over 40 minus 2. And in about two months following a single session of MPLT with the IQ577 uh, yellow laser, uh, the visual acuity improved to 20 over 25, and you see no evidence of any cystoid macular edema or, or the subretinal fluid collection. Uh, furthermore, what's interesting is this is the same patient. If you look, the pre-MPLT fluorescein angiogram on the left shows no visible signs. Uh, the, uh, you can, the one on the right, sorry, shows no visible signs of laser treatment uh, when you compare it to the one on the uh, pre-MPLT. In fact, there's a slight reduction in the hyperfluorescence but no evidence of any photocoagulative damage. This is a second case of a patient with a more severe type of uh, diabetic macular edema. This patient received six, a series of six intravitreal Avastin injections, again, a month apart. And you see the vision, visual acuity uh, here about uh, three weeks after the last Avastin injection in the upper scan, 20 over 100 minus 2, and it shows significant cystoid macular edema and diffuse retinal thickening and several patches of hard exudates. And in two and a half months after, again, a single session of MPLT using the 577, uh, the visual acuity improved to 20 over 60. And a, uh, there's been a moderate reduction in the overall thickness uh, of the uh, retina. And what's interesting and what's illustrative with this case is that the visual acuity improvement is significantly better than what would be anticipated by just the overall reduction in, in the CSMT, as demonstrated in OCT. And this is fairly typical of uh, the majority of patients uh, that I have treated uh, with the MPLT, that their visual acuity is often out of keeping with what would be expected based on their reduction in uh, OCT uh, foveal thickness. Uh, case three uh, was an interesting one because it was a particularly tough one. This patient had six intravitreal Avastin injections, again, a month apart, and um, failing that, uh, he was uh, given a, a single intravitreal triamcinolone injection after that period. The upper scan shows what the macula looked like four months after that triamcinolone injection, and um, here you have the visual acuity at best at 20 over 80 minus 2. 
A single session of MPLT, again using the 577 laser, was given. And over a period of about six months, uh, the vision improved significantly, 20 over 30. And you see a significant reduction in the, uh, in the foveal uh, thickness and also a normalization of the foveal uh, depression. Uh, what's impressive is there was no other intervention done within the six-month period. There was no further intravitreal avastin or trimcinolone or uh, repeat MPLT. Now, how do I actually apply MPL, uh, MPLT? I first begin by establishing a test spot. And I put the uh, laser on continuous uh, wave mode and start around uh, 40 to 60 milliwatts, again with a 200 micron spot size and 0.2 second duration. And then I titrate, you know, 10 to 20 uh, milliwatts gradually until I see a visible burn. Once that's established, I then switch the laser to micropulse mode with a 5% duty cycle. I don't recommend going higher than 5% uh, when you're doing macular work. And then I maintain the other parameters, the spot size as well as the duration. But then I increase the power threefold or fourfold um, uh, at that point. And then I apply a very confluent uh, overlapping grid, uh, as you is illustrated right below. Not only over the entire edematous area, but including uh, the fovea itself. Now, uh, in my clinical practice, I tend to divide the diabetic macular edema into three classes of severity, the mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is what I consider uh, less than 250 microns. Uh, as far as the central subfield mean thickness on the OCT. In those patients, I uh, go straight to MPLT. I may or may not use anti-VEGF if there are proliferative changes occurring, but uh, if I'm just treating the diabetic macular edema, I don't use pharmacotherapy and go straight to MPLT. If the patient has moderate uh, diabetic macular edema, basically between 250 to 400 micron of the CSMT, I will start with typically two anti-VEGF injections. If I don't see a significant reduction in the CSMT, uh, that's what I've chosen in our, in our clinic is a 20% reduction uh, over the baseline uh, OCT, then uh, I will stop the uh, pharmacotherapy and go straight to MPLT. If, however, there is a response and there is continued response uh, over 20%, I will go up to three additional anti-VEGF injections, again, a month apart. My experience has been that usually after four, if you're not seeing a, a significant response, doing further anti-VEGF um, therapy uh, gets very low yield. And then once I've maximized on the uh, anti-VEGF uh, uh, agents, I will then do an MPLT. Then for the severe uh, diabetic macular edema patients, those that have more than a 400 micron CSMT, I will typically begin with three serial anti-VEGF injections and will consider three additional ones, again, if there is a significant response being demonstrated. And if the CSMT is, is uh, lower than 400 microns after the end of that anti-VEGF series, I will then apply a single session of MPLT. If, however, after the anti-VEGF sessions, there's still significant uh, macular edema, in other words, more than 400 microns, I will then consider intravitreal corticosteroids in the form of triamcinolone or Ozodex, and then go ahead and do a single MPLT session a month after that uh, steroid administration. Now, um, financial implications of MPLT, I can tell you personally that um, in our clinic, our laser volume has significantly increased. Um, the laser session time, interestingly enough, per patient has significantly decreased. Um, and the time now it takes me personally is equivalent to that of an intravitreal injection. And the reason behind that is that unlike conventional uh, continuous wave focal and grid laser where you have to really study the fluorescein angiogram and also tiptoe around the fovea, um, it is a fairly routine uh, application, and I think you'll find this when you talk to other MPLT users, that uh, once that threshold spot size is determined, that grid is applied uniformly. There's no, uh, I find that I'm not having to do a separate session for microaneurysm, uh, doing focally and then going to do a grid. It's basically a grid application. 
My injection volume, in other words, uh, intravitreal anti-VEGF agents has been reduced. Um, and we, uh, our practice manager has told us uh, over and over that it's been a distinct uh, compensation advantage since we started using uh, MPLT. Uh, here's a good uh, comparison of uh, what uh, doing an average of seven injections of intravitreal Avastin for DME, that's the first uh, or the second column, versus a combination scenario of both pharmacotherapy as well as laser, uh, two laser sessions in a year plus five, say, five cumulative injections, significant difference in terms of the compensation and reimbursement. So it's something to think about. And that's it. So thank you, Dr. Mansoor. I'm also very pleased to have with us is Dr. Jeff Luttrell, uh, our first commercial user of the uh, Micropulse laser therapy with infrared. Um, he'll be, uh, he, who just recently released his 10-year follow-up data. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, uh, in Retina a few months ago, we published uh, a long-term study focusing on the, the safety of um, Micropulse laser for a diabetic um, macular edema and, and macular edema due to branch vein occlusions. And, and basically the bottom line is we found um, that using a low-duty cycle is, is the key to uh, safe and effective treatment um, with um, no eyes treated at a 5% duty cycle, uh, demonstrating any evidence of uh, retinal damage um, from treatment by any method that we employed, including uh, various types of fundus photography, including autofluorescence, fluorescein angiography, or spectral domain OCT with follow-up as long as 10 years. And then we looked at the tissue temperature modeling on the, uh, and using a computational model, which um, basically confirmed and supported the clinical observations as well as uh, um, some ideas we've talked about as far as um, uh, empirical models of safety like the American National Standard, Standard Institute uh, maximum permissible exposure levels we talked about in our first paper uh, a year, uh, several years ago. So at any rate, um, um, the low duty cycle is really critical because we'll, the entire point of of micropulse is to do effective treatment that's absolutely harmless and because of the high density we use because of the uh, ability to treat through the fovea it's extremely important to um to reliably and confidently uh, not have any uh, laser induced retinal damage and uh, the key to that uh, one of the main keys to that seems to be of keeping the duty cycle quite low now, I'm going to show uh, three cases of, uh, of, of patients that I think illustrate the usefulness of micropulsing practice. Uh, this first um, case is a, is a patient with a branch retinal vein occlusion. Um, you can see that in the, the top uh, red free photograph, there's a large area of swelling above the macula and, and microvascular change, and the OCT shows a serious detachment of the macula. Now, this is a patient was treated with Lucentis a month before this picture, and you just have to take my word for it. It looks exactly the same as before the treatment. I showed no response whatsoever to Lucentis. Micropulse uh, laser was uh, performed, once again, high density, low intensity, and through the fovea, and uh, showed uh, uh, progressive improvement in macular edema uh, from six weeks on as long, up to seven months when this uh, 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 OCT was taken. Um, and it sh sh shows the ability of Micropulse to work when drugs don't, and there are reasons that um, uh, very sensible reasons why uh, that might be the case we can discuss later. Uh, but one thing I'll just throw out for you is that uh, this eye will probably continue to improve. It's very common to see micropulse uh, patients uh, improve for years after a single treatment. And when I see improvement, even though there might be residual swelling, uh, I don't treat again. I just watch, and it will watch uh, hopefully as they continue to improve. Uh, this next patient is a, illustrates, a, uh, I think, a, one of the most important niches for um, for micropulse, and that is uh, patients with subclinical diabetic macular edema, uh, diabetic macular edema that's asymptomatic uh, generally and that's not detectable clinically that you can only see in high-resolution OCT. You know, uh, I think we can all appreciate that um, uh, catching these patients early, treating them effectively before they have significant swelling and visual loss is probably going to improve their long-term visual prognosis and, and, and ease management. Because of the safety of micropulse, uh, it, it's uniquely um, uh, situated to uh, provide treatment for these patients. And so here's a patient I, I had with um, very little central uh, foveal swelling, good visual acuity, completely asymptomatic, but you can see the swelling uh, near the fovea. And this swelling was due to uh, focal microaneurysmal leakage. 
I performed the micropulse in high-density high fashion right through the fovea, and a few months later you can see that the visual acuity is better. There's absolutely no uh, detectable damage from the laser, and the swelling is, is all gone. Uh, I want to emphasize that this patient's leakage was due to microaneurysms. I mean, made absolutely no attempt to treat them focally. As to focally treat these aneurysms, you've got to use shorter wavelengths and higher energies that are going to do damage, and that's exactly what we want to avoid with micropulse. Uh, the third patient illustrates an, another very uh, common clinical scenario. Um, a patient has um, a center involving macular edema with a large foveal cyst uh, due to diabetes. In this case, the visual acuity was uh, decreased, but not awfully bad. And what I do in my practice often is um, I'll use combination therapy. Um, and my indication generally is, is not necessarily the degree of macular edema, because the 810 uh, wavelength goes through retinal thickening of, of any degree without any difficulty. Uh, I'll tend to use drugs if, there's, uh, if the visual acuity is poor. If they're 2040 or worse, I'll tend to use a, a Vastin um, to try to get them seen better more quickly and then use that in combination with the laser to try to keep a good drug back quickly, wear off, uh, wear off quickly. Uh, the laser works more slowly but lasts longer, and I think they're potentially complementary. So this patient illustrates that point. Uh, uh, Vastin was given. Uh, the macrodema uh, improved quite a bit. The visual acuity uh, got better. And at that point, I did uh, micropulse, uh, once again, transfolvial treatment. And um, months later, the macrodema was all gone, and the uh, visual acuity was quite good. Uh, so using micropulse uh, with drug therapy, uh, if, if necessary, or if you just feel that, that that's the thing to do, uh, um, can be very effective and allow you to manage these patients uh, very nicely without uh, any retinal damage or uh, risk to the central visual acuity. Uh, now I believe we're going to open up to questions. I uh, appreciate the chance to be here and, and share my uh, experience with Micropulse with you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Luttrell. Yes, Tim, I'm here. But before we start the Q and A, before we start the Q and A, I wanted to make a brief announcement. The Micropulse module is now available in our green laser platform, the IQ 532. So Iridex now offers a complete portfolio of green, yellow, and infrared to meet the specific needs of your practice. Um, to schedule a free demo of the phobia friendly Micropulse laser therapy, you can email us at demo at iridex.com, D E M O at iridex.com, just give us your information and we'll be happy to uh, schedule a free demo. Okay, and now for the panel questions. Jeff, Sam, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm here. here. I can hear you fine. Uh, great, great. Well, thank, thank you gentlemen for uh, uh, sharing some very compelling uh, case studies. Um, and we're getting lots of good questions here from the field. So without further ado, I'll just I'll start jumping into them. Um, so first question here is going to go, a lot of questions on this front, uh, on what other macular disorders you currently treat. Maybe, Jeff, if you could, uh, you wouldn't mind starting with that one. There seems to be a lot of interest on CSC specifically. That a lot of questions coming in on that. Well, I, I, I treat any kind of retinal vascular disease. Um, from any, any cause, uh, diabetic retinopathy, branch vein occlusions, uh, you know, whatever it might be. I, I treat non-proliferative retinopathy and clinically significant diabetic macrodema. I, I treat proliferative retinopathy. Um, so um, pretty much anything like that. Also, um, central serous corneal retinopathy it works very well for. Um, just treat through the entire area of, of uh, fluid and, and even around the, the area of fluid uh, uh, for a margin. Um, and... Um, I, I think it's, it's not useful for things like cortilinear vascularization or getting rid of drusen and so on, be, simply because it's non-damaging. Um, so those are those are the things I use it for. How, how about you, Sam? What have you uh, incorporated in your practice now? With uh... yeah, pretty, pretty much the same thing as uh, Jeff just indicated. Um, we're doing a little bit more with um, MPLT for proliferative diabetic retinopathy with the 577 um, in kind of three zones with increasing du uh, duty cycle as we get to the peripheral regions. 
Uh, we also started a protocol to revisit um, uh, Drusen uh, with the 577, and I know Jeff is also considering a protocol as well using the uh, 810. So um, basically, uh, almost certainly all the conditions that anti-VEGF uh, uh, therapy is indicated for, uh, plus others. Right. Now, we had a question come in from Arizona just now about, uh, let's see, I want to make sure I interpret it correct. It's microaneurysm uh, of medium-sized clustered in and around the fovea in NPDR, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Do you, uh, how, do you, how do you address that? Maybe we'll start with Sam on that one. Yeah, I, um, uh, I used to have uh, a uh, separate parameters where I would treat the focal uh, microaneurysms uh, and then proceed with MPLT in a grid fashion. Uh, now I uh, don't. I actually uh, set, as I indicated in the presentation, uh, the threshold test burn and usually triple or quadruple it, the power, and then I grid the entire uh, fovea, uh, whether there's microaneurysms or there or not. As a matter of fact, uh, I have, uh, you know, veered away from uh, trying to treat microaneurysms because invariably, and, I, you know, Jeff certainly can share his experience, by my limited experience, uh, they tend to, A, either not leak or start to shrink following the MPLT grid session alone. I see. How about you, Jeff? I, I make no attempt to treat microaneurysms. Uh, I, I treat... Um, Influent uh, pattern. Um, I try to cover the area of thickening entirely uh, with the uh, micropulse. I, I really don't use angiography for much. Um, the, the amount of leakage and the nature of the leakage is really essentially irrelevant to what we're doing here. Uh, we're treating macular thickening, and um, and as I showed in that in that one case, that was that was. The, Essentially, what I think what, what the question was about is a, a patient with mm -hmm. with a cluster of microaneurysms at the foveal edge causing macular edema, and I treated that with confluent micropulse right through the fovea. Made no attempt to treat the microaneurysms. Visual acuity improved, and the macular edema uh, resolved completely. So I, I don't think there's uh, any any benefit to treating microaneurysms. Microaneurysms. I think once again, as I mentioned, you've got to generally use shorter wavelengths and higher powers that are going to do damage, and that's we're trying to avoid here. We're trying to do absolutely no damage. Yeah, yeah. Now, I wanted to ask, too, there, there's a few questions coming in about, I guess these would be steered towards Sam with your test burn. Sure. Um, if you can talk through that a little bit. How, how do you perform a uh, test? Just, just at the how outset, do you perform I just that want test to, burn? Uh, I just want to uh, make sure that, the you know, the audience knows, uh, you know, uh, there's, a big, there's a difference between the 810 and the visible 577 and the uh, 532, the green and the yellow, uh, namely in that uh, the 810 uh, laser that Jeff uses has the advantage of being able to, as he indicated, cut through, you know, whether there's uh, vascular abnormalities and microaneurysms and what have you. It can cut through and reach the target RPE uh, without using, causing internal uh, retinal problems or uh, absorption. Uh, with the 577 532, you have to be careful of that. That's why we go to that. That's why I prefer to go to the test spot. Um, and the test spot, as I indicated, I, 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 I just use 200 microns, 0.2 millisecond duration, and I use the Mainster uh, uh, or Area Centralis uh, lenses, so uh, it doesn't radically change the magnification of the of the spot. And then I start typically around you know 60 uh, milliwatts. And I, I go for an area that's not bone dry, but somewhere halfway between the arcade uh, and the center of the fovea where there's, um, you know, edema. And then I titrate at that point. And then once I get a nice light, very just light uh, gray burn, I um, tending more to quadruple the power and go into the 5% duty cycle, maintaining every all the other parameters the same. And then I... Um, uh, you know, that grid that you have showing now would be a minimum in my – I've been actually started to go further and further, um, like Jeff, not only treating the thickened areas, but almost from arcade to arcade. Uh, if you think of what we're doing with MPLT, uh, then it doesn't necessarily just confine you to the immediate area that the edema is present. I would say that would be a minimum area that you would treat. Uh, how about you, Jeff? Do you uh – 
Yeah, I, I, I do it. I'm using the A10, I, I, and I, I, you know, I, I think A10 is really the, from my opinion, the ideal wavelength for micropulse. It's, it's selectively absorbed at the RP level. Uh, it's not absorbed by anything else. It goes through cataracts, vitreous hemorrhage. You can treat right through a hemorrhagic retinal vein occlusion without any difficulty. Uh, and because of that, um, and, and, and I've been working with it for, what, I've been using it exclusively now for 12 years. And I've got a lot of clinical experience of using a lot of different treatment uh, parameters. And, and then we've got our, we've got the ANSI, American National Standards Institute, maximum permissible mm -hmm. exposure data. We've now got temp tissue temperature modeling. And all of this um, is uh, very consistent uh, as far as uh, um, what we're doing here. But the point I'm getting around to make is, is when I use the micropulse on, say, macular edema, I use exactly the same parameters on every single patient, no matter what, whether they're black, Caucasian, cataract, pseudophagic, vitreous hemorrhage, intraretinal hemorrhage. It doesn't no matter how thick the retina is. It doesn't matter because none of those things are going to interfere with the A10. The target's the RPE, and I'm going to get there. So I use exactly the same settings, power, duty cycle, spot size, on every single patient, no matter what, I never touch that. And the only difference is how many spots I'm putting in, depending on how extensive the pathology is. And in and, and your cases, it, your central involved edema uh, cases were, were very compelling. Uh, now, how close to the fovea do you go? Do you go right over it? And, and then Sam's image here, we're showing, we go, it, looks, it goes right on over the fovea. I think Sam and I both treat right through the fovea if there's uh, pathology there. And this, I think this is a, a, something that it's, it's important to, to consider. I mean, the, the, the most difficult cases to treat and the ones that affect the patient the most are the ones that have the central foveal thickening. With, with micropulse, now we can treat the center of the fovea with the laser. Now, and also, you have to think about what we're doing here. What we're doing with this laser is not, it's, it's, the concept is very different than traditional, the traditional concept of photocoagulation. What the laser is really doing is it's making the retina healthier, and 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 that's the place we want to make it healthier. Um, and so the the treatment rationale, the, the techniques, the, the you know, clinical use of it are very different than, than conventional laser treatment, all in very good ways. And Sam, uh, you, the pattern density shown there was uh, was very dense. I mean, how, how would you describe to a, a first timer, uh, you know, how many spots, uh, you know, the, the density yeah. of the uh, Micropulse uh, treatment spots. The beauty of this uh, treatment, and um, again, I, I came as a very uh, reluctant skeptic, uh, is the safety margin is huge, um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the residents at uh, George Washington University, uh, we let them uh, do the MPLT right through the fovea as long as we, you know, they stay within the confines of the parameters we set. Um, so I find that the overlapping pattern is inconsequential, and, and literally that's what I do. Uh, if you want to kind of get a sense, I put that repeat rate almost at firing um, five to six shots a second. So it's going pretty at a pretty fast click, and I go up and down just like a finger sewing machine. Um, that's why I'm, I'm very excited, and I'm sure Jeff is, about the soon to upcoming uh, pattern release uh, <laughs> that Urdex will have for this. Uh, uh, but it literally takes me, you know, a quarter of the time of what a regular focal and grid uh, would take, even less than that. So yeah, you uh, mentioned that it was from uh, door. <laughs> the door time is equivalent to injection. Is that uh, yeah? And at least in our, in my experience, it is. Um, by the time I walk in, and uh, again, we have the techs who've already consented the patient, and uh, uh, and they're numbed, and uh, we, you know, put on the basically I just put on the contact lens, the parameter, uh, and and go. And uh, so it's um, it's very fast, surprisingly fast. Uh, you know, the, the comment made uh, by our techs was sometimes they didn't know if I, you know, saw the patient because I'd leave the room. And uh, they usually, when you do a laser, you know, you're in 10, 15, 20 minutes uh, with a PRP or what have you. So um, there's nowhere near that time. Now, a, a flurry of questions just literally came in about retreatment. Mm -hmm. So. I guess we'll start with uh, we'll start with Jeff on this. I mean, how do you decide to retreat if if you well, I guess there's one specific if you do not see a response, or more broadly, um, you know, w when do you typically schedule your patient for their next follow up? 
Well, when I first started doing this, I and you know this is a long time ago. I would I would see them back, and that that was before the OCT. And uh, if if they weren't entirely better at six weeks or so, I'd treat again. And I just kind of keep treating every six to twelve weeks until I got rid of all the macular edema, and I thought that was great. Um, and then when I got the OCT and we did we published a study in the ocular surgery in 2006 of uh, serial OCT after micropulse, and what we what we saw in that is that. Uh, you start seeing a little bit of improvement generally at about a month, but it really starts kicking in about two months, three months, and then it really picks up. And Parodi, I think, uh, published a paper on branch and treating branch vein occlusion macular edema with micropulse. And what they showed was that the swelling uh, could Im- continue to improve for up to two years after single treatment. And I, I basically began to see the same the same kind of things. Um, Early, early on. So I went from treating, and just kept hammering away until it was all gone, to with the OCT now what I do is, is I'll treat, and depending on the severity of the swelling, I'll see them back at six, to, six weeks to three months. And if I see any improvement at all, I leave it alone, and I'll just watch. And, and it very commonly, most commonly, you'll see just steady, gradual improvement. At six, or six weeks, uh, two months, uh, if they're not any better, I may still wait because it can kick in. If they're not worse, if they're worse at six or eight weeks, then I might do something else. I might give them a vast or something. I just in a little difference than than Sam is I will I will virtually always start with micropulse uh, first. It's absolutely harmless. It's painless. It's it's a no brainer to be the first line treatment um, unless their visual acuity is bad, and then I'll maybe give them a drug at that or you know off the bat to get them seen better. Um, but you don't need to treat very often if your patient. And, and, and watch these patients, they will just continue to get better slowly over a very long period of time. So I treat a lot less than I used to. Uh, now, how about you, Sam? When, when, when might you expect to start seeing uh, resolution of, of the thickness? It, it, with my parameters, and I would say they're probably on the conservative side, again, because of the visual wavelengths that we use, um, it's about the same time, uh, Jeff is saying, it's about uh, six to eight weeks uh, you... You know, I would not retreat certainly before three or four months, um, but you can sometimes see a rapid response in the first two to three weeks. Uh, again, this is maintaining the same protocol, and it, I find just it depends on you know the degree of thickening that was there. Uh, but often, and, and I don't know if <clears throat> Jeff's experience with this with the 810, but the patients come in uh, subjectively uh, reporting. You know, hey, I'm you know I'm seeing a lot better, and sometimes you know the snow and the acuity it's about the same. The, you know, the first two weeks after, or two weeks after, or three weeks after they come back for whatever. And I kind of poo pooed it initially. I said, okay, that's probably you know, a placebo effect. But no, even my stoic patients and the ones that are uh, you know not so uh, generous with their uh, comments, you know, say, yeah, you know, things are a little bit brighter, crisper, what have you. So you start seeing that you know in two, three weeks after uh, treatment. Yeah, if I can amplify that, when, when I agree with Sam. One of the, the thing that kept, when I first started doing this a dozen years ago, I would treat one eye, and then I'd have them back the next week for the other eye. And I'm not really kind of being entirely sure what was going on. I asked, well, how, you know, how's the other eye doing? What's what's going on? And I was struck over and over again by patients telling me that the eye I treated last week was, was much better. And I would check the... Uh, Acuity, and I would do this and that. Do an ant. You know, nothing was really better that I could see, but subjectively they were adamant things were better, and that kept me doing it until I could see the clinical uh, response begin to kick in at six, eight weeks, and so on. Right. And and then that recent study by uh, Bogosovic, um and just based, you know is able to demonstrate that phenomenon with microperimetry that that because of the the physiologic effects of the laser, we're making the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, behave better. We're making it healthier, um, and, and and if you think about it, you know, if we give a drug, we're basically we're it's a very univalent treatment. We're, we're we're treating essentially one thing that's going on, but when we make the RPE function better and and, and work in, in a more healthy fashion, that is almost certainly a multivalent uh, uh, effect. A lot of things are going on, and and it it and it's, it just stands to reason that you're going to get. Uh, other effects, they're going to, they're going to, the time course is going to be different uh, with the laser, and it, and it all fits very nicely with what what we see clinically. Mm-hmm. And 
Do you do you stand? Do you, maybe you can talk us through a little bit about? There's some questions about when to you know when to incorporate the injections. Um, right. And maybe yeah. you can talk you, through. You, you know, if, you know, if you don't see a reaction, or you know, sure. when do you decide, or how do you decide to go back to the injection, and maybe you can just talk through your algorithm a little bit. Sure, uh, and I'll tell you, this algorithm uh, is uh, certainly evolving. I can tell you for a fact that uh, the first category of less than 250 micron, uh, I probably less than 5% of the time use any anti-VEGF. And I'm kind of moving towards Jeff's uh, approach where, um, you know, you, you know, all of us, I think, in the audience have been doing enough of these anti-VEGF injections. Um, you know, it, it's not, um, you, you see, it's a law uh, of diminishing returns. So uh, I'm even cutting back. I used to, you know, initially had put the patient through six serial anti-VEGF injections before I even considered any other therapy. Uh, now, you know, if you know, I don't, if I'm not seeing a response uh, to the anti-VEGF agent after the first or second injection, I'm really going. And a lot of patients, I I, I think it's no secret that the diabetic macular edema does not respond that well. Uh, to anti-VEGF agents in terms of the uh, rate of thinning uh, compared to, uh, you know, basically steroids or certainly MPLT. So um, it, it's one that I would not flog. Uh, so I'm finding I'm actually, like I said, continuing to use less and less uh, anti-VEGF um, after uh, or before MPLT. Okay. Now, would, now we got a question here from Texas. It says... Have you ever tried micropulse in small residual, small retinal fluid pockets after a macular, after a retinal detachment? I have not. I have not. <laughs> Wouldn't hurt to try. Yeah, I, you know, that's a good point. Uh, I know uh, both Jeff and I have done it for pseudophagic macular edema um, and been pleasantly, uh, pleasantly surprised. Actually, Sam, I haven't. Oh, you haven't? Uh, no. You should try it. <laughs> Well, I think you're right. It probably would work. Yeah, it it actually has worked very well. And uh, the referring physician, the Reverend the cataract surgeon, was um, was uh, <laughs> swore that I actually um, used uh, an anti-VEGF when I tried to convince him. No, I did not. Um, so that was my first experience with it. And uh, again, it's not every single pseudophagic, but it's the ones that they're persistent or the referring doc is concerned about. And uh, so uh, I've gone straight to MBLT. I've not used any anti-VEGF or steroids uh, for these. Yeah, just along those lines, one of the interesting effects of, um, of micropulse, or at least that type of laser um, uh, tissue interaction, is that is that the, this type of laser uh, exposure to tissue actually reduces inflammation. So it, yeah. and it's not, so it's not it's acting on cytokine production too, but there are many other effects, and one of them actually actually reduced inflammation, which is the opposite of conventional laser treatment, which is one of the reasons that one of my patients would come in early on telling me about their subjective improvement, as Sam mentioned, that really got my attention because after conventional laser treatment, they're almost and they're usually worse right off the bat because you right. cause tissue damage, inflammation, and so on. They have to recover from that to get better. With the micropulse. Things turn around right away, and, and, they, and, and the patients can sense that. Yeah. Now we uh, let's see. We, now here's one on your, your side of the coast here, Sam. Um, how do you keep track of where you've treated, given that the grid treatment is not visible to the laser surgeon? That, well, that's the beauty of it. It's I don't want to say it's irrelevant. Uh, quite frankly, uh, one of the one of the reasons, not the main reasons, I've kind of veered almost to a, a arcade to arcade pattern is that. Uh, I, for the first, you know, six months I was doing this, I was meticulously looking at the OCP and, you know, approaching it like the way we, we would initially with con, uh, conventional laser and making sure I just treat the areas that are swollen. And then I realized, well, we don't need to worry about that. If we, as we discussed, what you're really doing is photostimulation of the RPE and probably uh, stimulating those that are sick uh, and what have you, then um, I find going almost arcade to arcade uh, in a pattern, I... There's there's no uh, concern with retreatment over the same area. Uh, there's no concern in that in terms of photocoagulative damage at all. Uh, and again, I was extremely skeptic about this, and I was on the other hand also concerned that you know maybe we're there's some delayed effects that we're not going to see for a few years, and then boom, you're going to see scar expansion. Well, just data has clearly shown that that's that's not the case uh, after a decade uh, of using this. 
Yeah, that was my my concern when I first started using it. Is that even though I didn't see any effects of the laser initially, and I did angiograms on patients sometimes an hour, a, a day, a week later, early on to see if what was going on there. And my big concern was that they would come in one day blind because I'd done something I didn't realize I'd done. You know, now now we know that if 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 there's an inadvertent, inadvertent burn, you'll see it virtually right away. We also know how to absolutely avoid that. And we know that uh, with very long follow-up, um, average four years, but up to 10 years in, in our retina article, uh, there is no evidence of, of, of any uh, uh, laser-induced pathology developing if, um, if there wasn't any there to begin with. I, I know that the, the, a lot of the questions around that uh, harken to the uh, PDT uh, experience, where, you know, you do this treatment, and, okay, everything looks good, and then, boom, you get this, you know, nasty scotoma, uh, and guys say, oh, my God, what did I do? Um, we have all went through that uh, <laughs> that stage, but this is totally different in that sense. I'm, I'm you know, very pleased with the, uh, the outcome. So yeah, far. It, it we, with, at least certainly with the 810 and Sam's working on the shorter wavelengths, but with the 810 certainly, we know, we know precisely um, the, the therapeutic range, the treatment parameters to be absolutely 100% reliably safe and effective. And as Sam alluded to this, before, with you know, with the micropulse, one of the things, and one of the things that lets me use a single treatment parameter um, setting for absolutely every patient, is is an extremely wide therapeutic window, yeah. ten times wider than with a continuous wave laser, and all you've got to do is be in that window, mm-hmm. and being and being hotter and doing more and, and more intense does not make for a better result. It just makes for a more likely burn. Right. And, bo- and both these gentlemen, it looks like five percent duty cycle seems to be the uh, magic number in both uh, both wavelengths. Is yeah. that uh, what happens? Is as you increase that duty cycle, you rapidly shrink the therapeutic window. Uh, going from a five to ten percent, you've cut the, you've cut the thermal relaxation time between pulses by half. So the so your risk of burn forming burn development goes up logarithmically as you decrease that duty cycle. So the low duty cycle is, and it is is the most essential ingredient to doing harmless treatment. And if, if you folks want to get a, a, a sense of it, when you start doing the MPLC, uh, and say you take a diabetic who's got proliferative changes and or even severe NPDR changes, uh, you can play around the duty cycle in the periphery and see what it does to get a real sense. So you may think, well, the 5% is not doing much or what have you. Well, you can crank it to 10 to 15%, and you start to see, you know, barely visible photocoagulative, which you certainly don't want to even consider in the, in, for any macular work. Yeah, I, I use 15% in the, for PRP in the periphery be, right. simply yeah. because the laser is not powerful enough to give me the, to give me the array. I want to, I want to be treated in about 40 to 50 times MPE, which is right in the middle of the therapeutic range. Unfortunately, with the lasers we have now, they're not powerful enough to do that at 5%, so I've got to turn it up to 15%. I would prefer to be treated at 5%, but it's not possible. Um, By chance, Jeff, do you have a patient that had a micropulse PRP in one eye and a standard uh, uh, PRP in the other eye? That the Oh, yeah, but that's your, I mean, I haven't used conventional treatment in, in over a decade, so <laughs> those people are not around anymore. But early on, I'll tell you, if you, want, if you want to see a happy patient, take a patient who had conventional PRP in one eye and then do micropulse PRP in the other eye. And when they get done, they pay, they got, the patient's just going to be flipped out how, what a totally different experience it was in a positive way. And, and in both wavelengths, that you gentlemen are just using topical? Yes. Oh, and gosh, yeah. Yeah, there's been, even for the PRPs, and I'm one, I'll tell you, um, uh, that would routinely um, drop a hat, use, uh, do a, a retrobulber for my PRPs. I would do them. In, you know, single session um, and what have you, but um, I haven't since I started using NPLT. Even with 15% duty cycle, uh, you know, you may get, you know, yeah, they can sense it a little bit, but it's nowhere near what uh, was being experienced by continuing. Let me just throw a little pearl in there about micropulse. It, in some ways, it, 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 it's a little, it's the opposite of argon. With the micropulse, as you turn up the, sp- as you increase the spot size, the pain increases. With, with conventional argon, it tends to go the other way. The smaller the spot, the more intense, the more painful. Micropulse is the opposite. Large spots are more painful. So if you've got a patient who you're doing, say, PRPN, and they're having pain, well, the first thing I do is, is I re- reduce the exposure time so it goes more quickly. But the other thing you can do is actually reduce the spot size. 
and, and that makes it more comfortable too. Mm. Yeah. Now the uh, let's see, we've got another one here. Actually, we've got two questions that came in on can micropulse be used for DME when an epiretinal membrane is present? Sure. Yeah. Micropulse doesn't know it's there. You might still have to peel the membrane. Yeah, and and I've done that in, in actually fairly you know regularly where there's still cystoid components of it, and um, you know the patient uh, for whatever reason doesn't want to get the surgery or you don't want to go take them to surgery or it's not significant enough. If you can get them, um, uh, you know, to a functional level with MPLT, uh, they're very happy campers. Oh, and, oh. and 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 you know the interesting thing is. Again, what Jeff alluded to, because you're not, we're not talking photocoagulation. So I know the whole concern about, you know, having shrinkage and contraction of that membrane. Um, that's not an issue here. Yeah. Actually, no, we're, we just got our first question from a patient. Um, oh. Let's see. Do they have and insurance? That, and I'll, actually, I'll leave that question. Are you starting to get patients asking for micropulse? <laughs> and then, but the question coming in says, would micropulse help pigment epithelial and neo exudate degeneration and vitreous degeneration. I, I take it you meant pigment of field detachments. Yes, That's there you go. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah. no, I don't know. Uh, are you talking about age related macular degeneration, I assume? Yeah, um, it's a, uh, someone's husband has macular degeneration in both eyes. It will not help choroidal vascularization, as far as I can tell. And it. I, I don't know if it would help a, a pigment field detachment. I haven't. I haven't tried that. I'm. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't. To Jeffy, as I mentioned er, uh, earlier, both Jeff and I are setting up protocols to look at kind of revisiting the CAPT uh, study um, for a laser for Drusen in dry ARMD. Um, uh, we're using the 577, getting that protocol. Uh, GW, uh, and I know Jeff, you're putting it together for the 810. If, um, honestly. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more. I, I personally, I'm, I, I did uh, 810 microfalls for Drusen years ago, and I didn't see uh, any effect. And I think there are reasons for that. I think you've got to do. I think you've got to do tissue damage to get rid of Drusen. You've got to elicit phagocytosis and so on. What, what I think may be very interesting, though, is treating patients with geographic atrophy. Uh, at a wide margin around the geographic atrophy. We may be able to catch the RPE around the areas of atrophy um, and uh, where it's not irreversibly um, senescent, and we might be able to um, uh, improve the health of those cells, reduce local inflammation, and possibly slow down the expansion of atrophy and prevent visual loss that way. That's, uh, that's my concept about where it might be useful in dry macular generation. I, I and on, on the on the patient side, and I don't know if gentlemen realize we just launched it a couple of days ago, so I just want to make uh, the whole audience aware, uh, as well as our, our panel here. We just launched a treatmydme.com website. So we have a patient education website, treatmydme.com. And I just want to bring that up. I, uh, I, I forgot to alert you guys, but we, we just went live on that uh, a couple of days ago. So hopefully... Uh, Hopefully, we'll find that a, a, a resource for uh, whether your patients or referring physicians. <clears throat> terrific, terrific. Okay, here a lot of questions coming in for you, Jeff. What exactly are your parameters for the infrared micropulse laser? Yeah, you know, I, I, I I'm not going to take time to go through those now. Micro uh, Iridex has those um, on their website, and I think some resources and, and uh, I've, I've laid them out real clearly as far as what are the settings. Um, so you can check that out. Um, like okay. I said, they're pretty uniform. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, I'll talk. To a video producer should be putting them online right now. So now these are my these are my macular parameters. Uh, now the, the power. I want to say one thing about power. I use about a nine nine a point nine to a nine point five watt power. One of the reasons I do that is I measure the power I put on my laser occasionally, and usually my fiber optic is about at least ten percent below what it ought to be. In our original paper um, on DME and the BJO back in 2005, I was using 0.78 watt power. If you, you knock about 10% efficiency off of this, we're really at about a, a real output of about 0.8 or so. So, but anywhere in that range. Uh, but I use these these uh, uh, this parameter um, these parameters on every single uh, macular patient, no matter what the problem is. Uh, Even central macula as well. 
diabetic macular edema, branch vein occlusion, whatever, you know, pseudophagic, phagic, no matter how swollen they are, what, it works for everything. Once again, the 810 is ideal for this because it goes through everything and uh, it's selectively absorbed by the RPE. RPE. So the things that the things that would cause you normally to adjust laser parameters are not relevant to 810 micropulse. And Sam, for your adjustment for central macula is based on the... Uh, well, what you, as we discussed before, you know, unlike the 810, when you're dealing with the 577 yellow or the 532 green, uh, there will be absorption, particularly if there's um, lesions uh, with color in them uh, in the uh, inner retina or even the outer retina. So um, that's why <clears throat> my uh, I still approach it uh, conservatively in the sense of the test spot and also... Um, not usually in my settings of like you know around 400 uh, to 500 milliwatts maximum. Uh, again, with a 200 micron spot size, so it's larger than what Jeff's using, and uh, the, uh, uh, the duration is uh, 200 milliseconds, so it's a little bit shorter than that, but still 5% duty cycle. So, and I have not seen any any uh, uh, photocoagulative, not even photocoagulative, but even significant structural alterations on the RP and. Uh, OCTs or uh, 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 autofluorescence or any of those other. And just to e echo that, you know, people will often question that, but you can do angiograms on these uh, these patients uh, anytime after, absolutely anytime after treatment. You will never ever see right. any breakdown of the blood retinal barrier, no RPE leakage, no al alteration of any kind at any point by any method. Now what? Um now, so we've got uh, oh, a lot of interesting case series on refractory edema, and uh, roughly, I mean, what percentage of your DME patients would you estimate are not responding to anti-VEGF? And I guess I'll, I'd like to start with Sam on that. I know you've done some sure. interesting research on uh, that. Sure. Well, we know probably, uh, again, how you define response, but we use the arbitrarily 20% reduction. There's nothing magic about it, but that's just a practical handle that we use. Uh, 20%, if there's no 20%, if you don't see anything uh, more than a 20% reduction, uh, then to us that is a uh, refractory treatment, at least to the anti-VEGF, and you need to consider it as something else. So I would say safely it's probably about 80% of the DMEs that come in. Um, you know, you're, you, I think all the clinicians in this webinar know that, you know, before anti-VEGF was around, uh, we had Kenalog, right, Trimcinolone. Now, for all its... its uh, you know, cataract and elevated pressure, uh, definitely it was the, the one other than laser that give you the biggest bang for the buck in terms of reduction of ME. Uh, Anti-VEGF agents have not been that uh, potent uh, in, to that degree. So, um, again, that's why uh, I don't, I personally have not uh, belabored the use of anti-VEGF agents. And uh, like I said, I'm moving more and more towards uh, Jeff's school of uh, uh, just say no to anti-VEGF agents, and, and you know, as initial treatment. So, uh, particularly for those that you know, um, uh, you have uh, they're not that swollen. There's not a, a ton of hard exudates. I mean, there's 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 no harm about going to MPLT. You haven't blown your wad by going to MPLT uh, initially. In my in our paper in Retina recently, we looked at all the patients we had treated that we. Um, evaluated pre and post operatively with spectral domain OCT, and one of the things that was interesting that micropulse alone was was effective in ninety over ninety percent of the eyes uh, that did not have center involving swelling, uh, which were two which were two thirds of the eyes. Yeah. Uh, so you don't need to even consider um, drugs in those in those patients. And the eyes that did have center involving macular edema and poor visual acuity, I tended to use a, a, a Vastin early on just to try to get them to see better, not because of retinal thickening, just based on visual acuity alone. And, and uh, I think about 71% or so of those eyes improved. But the interesting thing was, statistically, there was no difference in the effectiveness um, uh, of the combo therapy versus micropulse alone if you compared all the parameters we looked at. Yeah. Now, does it also? No, we got a few. We got a, a flurry here at the end of questions. Of does it work for CRVO and BRVO? And before you answer that, I wanted to remind the audience here, or make the offer, if you email us at Mac, the Micropulse Advisory Council, 
That's M-A-C at iridex.com. So Mac at iridex.com. Just give, uh, give us your contact information. We'll be happy to send you both Dr. Mansour's and Dr. Luttrell's exact uh, parameters for all of the uh, uh, clinical cases that you've seen. So we'll be happy to do that. But I'll, I'll kick it to you, gentlemen. Does it work for CRVO and BRVO? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I, I guess I wonder, though, with the CRVO, what, you, what would you be treating? Be like for PRP or macrodema? I, I generally don't use macro treatment for CRVO. I, my experience is it doesn't, it's not very effective. And if well, anything, this is, CRVO, I use drugs or, or these days more and more, I just bypass them surgically. Unlike, uh, unlike DME, uh, the RVOs do respond. I mean, if you look at all the conditions that respond, uh, to anti-VEGF therapy, all the, the RVOs definitely are right up there. Uh, it's certainly better than DME, and so I tend to start uh, those on uh, you know serial anti-VEGF, uh, probably three three monthly uh, treatments of the vast, and then uh, after that, if there is still residual um, edema, I may or may not, uh, depending on how thick it is, I may or may not go to triamcinolone. But I I still have used MPLT. Um, on both, uh, but like Jeff said, I don't know for CRVO. Your you know your expectations are in terms of visual recovery is not as good as obviously with BRVO. I would just echo all that, and, and you know with with BRVO, they just tend to be much more frustrating because they tend to wax and wane. They'll get better, they'll get worse, and all this. And I, and I agree with Sam that the, the drugs are much more useful for uh, vein occlusions and the diabetic macular edema. And I'll, I'll, I'll mix and match. I'll just go back and forth. Whatever's working at the moment, I'll use. And it's, it's very interesting that with, with diabetic retinopathy, usually you treat it, it gets better, and you're in good shape. With the, with the vein occlusions, it's just a back and forth, back and forth. And this, until one day, it kind of stops acting up and you're okay. Which is another um, illustration of the value of micropulse, because you can do all that, and at the end of the day, the patient has, has suffered absolutely no harm, the retina is perfectly undamaged, and the visual potential is still hopefully very good because they haven't suffered any ill effect of treatment. The, the one thing that we started to do, and actually has been very interesting, is doing the sectoral treatment exactly with those cases that Jeff has mentioned where, you know, they've got a... Uh, 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 one of the main um, uh, arcade vessels occluded, and you're um, going to do a sector laser, and that's where we've found that with the 15% um, uh, duty cycle and the peripheral portion distal to the arcade, it's um, uh, amazing how you don't see the neovascularization coming back, and it's just such a light treatment. You know, I, quite honestly, initially I was worried because I thought, okay, this is going to be, you know, a recurrence and what have you, and, uh, you know, Six to eight months. There's no even on forcing angiography, no evidence of any leakage, and these are very uh, would be considered a light treatment if you were trying to do it with continuous wave uh, laser. So that's another thing where you know you might want to uh, try uh, for those recurrent, uh, you know, uh, or BRVOs that have recurrent macular edema. Now, have you have either of you, I guess, tried uh, 20 millisecond duration? So it sounds like a question regarding. Uh, um, Sub-threshold uh, uh, scanning versus micropulse, but is a 20 millisecond duration of the same as micropulse? No, 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 no. I, I, I have tried it since the early 90s in terms of doing. So I was I was a big adopter of sub-threshold, uh, and uh, um, you know, millipulse as we affectionately like to call it, as opposed to micropulse. You will uh, just to give you an idea in one of the satellite clinics. Uh, where we didn't have uh, micropulse, uh, uh, we were doing that for for quite a while. Where we would using the uh, you know the laser uh, on a point uh, three point sorry, uh, it's it's 50 milliwatts. The lowest you can set some of the, um, the certainly the, the uh, uh, 532 is uh, at least Iridex is 50 uh, milliwatts and point uh, zero three uh, seconds, and. Uh, uh, I thought, okay, this is going to be a safe mode and what have you. And sure enough, when you try to apply these grids, certainly you could not even do what Jeff and I were doing in terms of a confluent over right through the fovea grid. You wouldn't, you would, uh, I would not recommend it <laughs> because you do see actually late pigmentary changes. You don't even have to see them on the, on the angiogram. A lot of times you can actually see this pigment. It's like a fine peppering. 
and the patient subjectively start to complain. And that was the that was the uh, reason why I kind of abandoned it uh, uh, pretty much uh, because you do cause photocoagulative damage and uh, and the cumulative dam and the damage is cumulative. Yeah, the, the short pulse uh, continuous wave laser has two significant drawbacks. Uh, one is is uh, it's continuous wave, and so you have a very, very narrow therapeutic window between doing nothing and doing and getting a burn. And just simply, you know, uh, just the simple variations in the pigmentation of the RPE, yeah. when you have such a narrow therapeutic window, will cause you to have very little effect on one burn. The next burn will be white hot. So that's it's it's almost it's virtually impossible to avoid uh, retinal damage and achieve a therapeutic effect with a continuous wave laser. That's one thing. The other thing is that is that with these very short wavelength lasers like the Pascal, it, they 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 are they have almost like a cookie cutter effect. They essentially they essentially ablate and destroy what they hit. But they leave the surrounding tissue essentially undisturbed. Um, when you're using a continuous wave laser or any kind of destructive laser the stuff that you've destroyed is doing nothing for you. It's, the, it's as Sam showed in that picture, and we've got a paper coming out, a review article in clinical reviews in diabetes in a few months. We have a nice diagram showing this. But but the, what's, the thing that's working for you with the continuous wave laser is the stuff that survives around the margins that you haven't killed. That's what's giving you a clinical effect. When you go to these very short pulse continuous wave laser, there is essentially almost no no uh, rim of tissue like that. It's sim simply like a cookie cutter. What's inside the beam is dead. What's outside the beam doesn't know anything happened. And, and therefore, your, your, the clinical effect of that, as far as a therapeutic effect, is minimized. Yeah. I think that's, that's the part exactly, uh, Jeff knows. I noticed also that um, one click, you know, one click in terms of the wattage is off, you will get photocoagulative damage that you don't see immediately and that's that's the part that uh, I mean take a look at you know all some of the older patients uh, you, you've had when we used conventional um, focal or grid and look at the scar expansion or look at the referrals that we get from some of our um, colleagues uh, and and I know they didn't go crazy and, and treat with very high settings but it's just that that continuous scar expansion because of the photocoagulative damage now Jeff, now Jeff I we got a question here about, let's see, where's it coming from? What do you think the cellular mechanism is of micropulse? That's a loaded question. So we'll, well, you know, actually, it's really interesting. I've been looking into it. There's, there's a, a large body of, of literature, there are journals devoted to this fact, uh, or to these concepts, a journal of photobiology and photochemistry and all this. Uh, the, the effects of low-powered lasers on tissues are, are really pretty well known and have been largely understood for a, a well over 20 years. Um, the effects we're having with this laser is, is not just melanin absorption. We're, we're affecting uh, cytochrome C oxidase. We're affecting, we're, uh, affecting uh, um, you know, enzymes with metal cations in the Krebs cycle. We're doing all kinds of things with these lasers. And, and, and the interesting thing is when you use a low duty cycle, when you use a low power, especially infrared or near infrared laser, the effect is generally to take a cell that's in an unhealthy environment, a sick cell, and make it behave in a more, a more normal fashion. It gets healthier. If you treat normal cells in a normal environment, it doesn't really do anything. But if you treat a cell that's sick in a bad environment with these low, low power infrared or near infrared lasers, they they become more normal, and it, and the effect it has many effects on the cell, and in in addition, interestingly enough, it reduces inflammation. Uh, and so you know one thing we know about macular degeneration is that a lot of some patients uh, may be predisposed to bad disease because they have genetic factors that predispose or cause uh, 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 local inflammation in the retina. Well, this interestingly could be a, a treatment for that, because one of the effects of micropulse like as, as well understood in other tissues, appears to be reducing inflammation. Um, so uh, the interesting thing is, is, is that how little we discuss this, how little we talk about, how little we seem to know about all of this in, in ophthalmology when we're the guys that really brought lasers to the fore and we use them all the time, but this is so well known outside of ophthalmology. 
So what the micropulse is doing with subvisible, invisible, undetectable treatment is really exactly is is, is very well known uh, generally as far as the tissue effects. It's, and it fits with it fits perfectly with what we understand about the pathophysiology of these diseases and how we want to treat them. Okay, and, and, and in closing, and I appreciate uh, the audience's time. We, we literally had, we have from Japan all the way out to the East Coast, so we had a nice, uh, we had a broad range here. Um, so thank you uh, for attending. Um, I know we didn't get to address all the questions, so we'll certainly uh, follow up um, with those. If you ever have any questions for our panel, you can reach them at MAC at iridex.com, mac at iridex.com. But in closing, gentlemen, if you had a friend that was going to do micropulse therapy tomorrow, what type of patient would you recommend? And I'll, I'll field that to both of you. Maybe we'll start with you, Sam. Uh, I think um, you don't have to take the sickest of the sickest and with the, those with the thickened edema. I would take a patient, uh, sure, if there's one that has a juxtafovial or extrafovial patch of edema, and you're worried, go ahead and try it through there until you get comfortable. Uh, but I'm willing to bet you, and, and I, again, I was a pretty uh, healthy skeptic, uh, you'll migrate to transfovial uh, treatment very quickly uh, because you'll see how safe, basically, the laser uh, is. Yeah, I, I would say any patient. I mean, what, what you've got here is an absolutely harm, it, it, it's an absolutely harmless treatment that's effective. Why would you not use it first on anyone? Yeah. Uh, well, I, gentlemen, I just wanted to personally thank you for uh, your innovation and your continual drive towards finding a better solution for your patients. And to the audience, thanks for your time. And again, if you'd like to schedule a free demo, just simply email us your contact information at demo at iridex.com. That's D-E-M-O at iridex.com. So thank you all, and uh, stay tuned for the next. Jeff, Sam, have a good evening. You too. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, guys.